everybody, Susan Fincher, your host for All Volunteer, All Heart for Binky Patrol. And we are continuing our series with these amazing, outstanding, beautiful people that I have met through the Mr. Ballin Foundation. That's what links us all. We are trying to change lives, help people heal, help people grow, and make the world a better place. And today, my guest is Sarah, who is with the Ride Foundation, which is the ridefoundation.org. And they are all about helping horses and healing hearts. And we're gonna hear how those things tie together and all the different aspects of what they do. Sarah, welcome. I'm so glad you were able to join me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. So I what I love is all the pieces that you have and all the ages you cover. And I'm wondering if you can give everybody a little bit of background of how wild mustangs tie to healing people whether it's from addiction abuse keeping them from picking up bad habits of violence in you know hard hit areas tell me what's going on so that's a great question um that's one of the most often asked questions is how do wild horses help people it you know it's hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around um so we help people with emotional trauma. That's our goal. That's kind of the first part of our dual mission. Um, so we take unadoptable wild horses from the Bureau of Land Management. Some of them have already been placed in homes, but they weren't able to be successful there. And so the, instead of getting returned back to the Bureau of Land Management, um, they get brought into our program. So the, the wild horses really have a um, survival instinct that we don't find in the domesticated horses. Uh, these horses have had to survive for generations out in the wild. So they're more in tune to some of these body language and nonverbal communication um, that the domesticated horses aren't really in tune with because they're just standing in their stall being brought feed and water and, you know, kind of living the life of luxury for the most part. Um, so using the wild horses has really been beneficial in a way that they are like a mirror in the way that they show people what kind of energy they're putting out. So when we work with emotional control and nonverbal communication skills, um, we can really see where we lack by what the horse is showing us. And so, for instance, uh, with a group of veterans, we the horse starts with our veterans group. And uh, they, I gentle the horse down to a point where it is, you know, understanding a little bit about partnering up with a human. And then I invite the veterans to come in one at a time into the round pen. And the first, I'm always in there with them, but when they first come in, the horse usually has its head really high. It's kind of running around as far away from the participant as that it can get. Um, and then I coach that participant to unclench their fists maybe don't stand in an aggressive posture, maybe be in more approachable stance, uh, biting down on the jaw. Some uh, people don't breathe. They'll just kind of be there, just kind of, you know, nervous and kind of holding their breath. And so I say, take a deep breath, unclench your fist, you know, all these little things that I'm seeing. And when they're able to control themselves and what they're putting out, then the horse will drop its head and come into them and partner up with them. So by showing them, how they are, you know, communicating to the horse, you know, all by nonverbal um, at the beginning, for sure. Uh, then they're able to control that. And they can take that with them out into the world when they're starting to get overwhelmed. And there's, you know, you've seen the guy walking through the store and everyone kind of grabs their kid and kind of moves yeah. them. Over. That person's having a bad day or some sort of trouble. Um they aren't usually aware that they're doing that, but by working with the horse, and this is just one small example, but by working with the horse, they're able to see how their energy and how they're carrying themselves affects others. Wow. So working with the horse just shows them what they need to see. And then they practice with the horse and pretty soon that it can just go over all aspects of their life because now they're aware of it, which most of the time that's just what it takes is to be made aware of it. But as a person, I could sit here and tell them, you should be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. That really has no effect. But when they see it through the horse and that 
horse is nervous, the horse is scared, you know, they their whole life has been turned upside down from running free and wild to now being captive. Um, so when the horse shows them these things, it means a lot more to them than a human just telling them. Wow. Two of them working together. That's really a cool picture that you've just painted. I love that. Thank you. And I know for your link to Mr. Ball, and that is definitely with the veterans program, correct? Yes. So the Mr. Ball and Foundation, um, it's actually kind of a crazy little story because there's so many scams and so much stuff going on these days. And my phone's ringing all the time. And half the time, I don't even pick it up because it's another scam call. Um, but I get this call from Lori saying, hi, I really want to help you guys out. I love what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, people don't just call me and say they want to help me right. like this. Um, so I was very apprehensive about it. But um, yeah, what a great team of people and what an amazing thing they've got going on. And they've been a huge blessing to our veterans group, our co-ed veterans group. They sponsor for uh, they sponsored for one entire year, um, wow. sponsored that group to be go through the program. So we try to do everything with no cost to the participants. We find um, sponsors, we find program um, supporters. We have all these creative ways of, of getting this paid for without the participants having to pay. Um, and they were just huge in taking care of our veterans for the one year. So it's been really, really nice. And um, they came here to the ranch. Lori came to the ranch and met the group and, sat in on one of the um, sessions that we had and it was really amazing and really, uh, really cool to introduce her and the team to the directly to the people that they're helping support. Wow. Well, and I have a similar story with them. Lori had sent us an email. What? What a scam. Is this going to be one of those Nigerian scams where they process it and we just need this money to wire transfer and all that. But there's no way. My husband said, throw it away. I said, no, something's sticking with me on this one because it was so plain spoken and it felt it felt genuine to me. And I'm always you know, looking for the lemonade and everything. And we checked them out six ways a Sunday. Anyway, it's like it's squeaky clean. It's real, honey. It's legit. So, okay, then call her. So that was it. And I couldn't believe it. It's like, wow, to be a part of this network with all of you, with all these other wonderful organizations. And my wheel starts turning. It's like, how can I, you know, how can Binky Patrol help all of you guys? Do you need blankets? You know, this podcast that we're doing, you know, let's raise awareness. What can I do to help? Because I want to be part of that solution for all of you too. And that's the byproduct of this gift, this network that we've been introduced to. Yes, I agree 100%. Totally unexpected. Yeah, the icing on the cake. It yeah, is. I got the call and I called up our marketing um, director of our marketing and I'm like, hey, you know, I just got this really weird call. I'm kind of caught off guard. I'm not sure what to think. <laughs> and her, it was the Mr. Pollen Foundation. She said, oh my gosh, I listened to that storyteller every day like I listen to Mr. Paul and I'm familiar with all of this so she dove in and figured it all out but she it was just weird how it connected she knew exactly who he was and what they were doing um of course I didn't know because I'm out there playing with horses all day you know <laughs> but she's the marketing chick she spends all her time you know online researching and doing this sort of thing so she knew exactly who they were cool <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have a few volunteers and they said, are you kidding? That's who's helping us? I said, yeah. And I don't know. I do not make binky deliveries. I can't make blanket deliveries because I get too emotional with it. I want to keep all the kids. I want to hug all the moms. And that's just not appropriate many times. But I just like, oh, and I can't. So I have a delivery team that does that. But on the same story he's an amazing storyteller i listened to one or two episodes but for me it i have to guard my little heart because it broke my heart because i put, he's such an a great storyteller that i'm there with him walking through almost like i have a you know a oculus on my face and i'm walking through the scenes with him and i couldn't do it and you know, some people can listen to those things and I'm glad because that means they're made aware and they understand what's going on and people that are fans too, that's what's helping to fund all this great work that they're doing for all of us. So yeah, I'm grateful for that, but I want to get back to 
for you, the Ride Foundation. Um, tell me about these programs because you have so many things people can do. They can get involved in many ways, but let's go through the, um, let's start, we've talked about the veterans, but not much. Tell me more about that. So the veterans group start, I start the horse and get them to a place where they're not wild, right? To where I can actually get someone in there with me. So the veterans usually uh, observe that process. So we have a uh, seven foot high walls on a round corral with an elevating deck that's covered that oversees the corral. Mm -hmm. So they're there with me to go through the process of getting the horse gentled down and they see why the horse is responding in a way. And a lot of times they really can feel what that horse feels because they a lot of times feel in the same way, having emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. So they can really, um, like it resonates with them how the horse is and what the horse is doing because it's all about survival mode. They are stuck in a survival mode and they're trying to figure out our world. So I show them, you know, through a lot of work, how they can join up with us and be our friend and create that willing partnership. It all comes down to that willing partnership. So by creating that uh, partnership with the horse and the veterans watching and understanding why the horse is reacting in a certain way, why I'm positioning myself and doing what I'm doing in order to um, influence that horse's behavior, because our whole basis of everything is not controlling the horse. It is controlling yourself to influence that horse's behavior. So we do it in a way where there's no ropes. And uh, by the time the veterans come in, I have that horse working at Liberty really well, where they don't have ropes or halters or anything on them. They have free will. It's their choice to work with us or not work with us. So that's really where um, a lot of healing comes in is they see the transformation from that horse being wild and scared and then changing and turning into a willing partner that wants nothing more than just to be with us as you know the human and the leader of the partnership. So then the veterans come in one at a time we work through with the horse that horse is usually in that program for at least a year working with the veterans um at least once a month a lot of times it's twice a month um just around the schedules right um and so then the horse goes from that group and we use that horse now it's good enough uh, gentled enough and knows its job well enough to be part of the recovery and addiction program we work with in town, they're in patient re residents at a recovery center in town, and they will come up and work with the horse. We were doing it every week during certain times of the year. It's harder because with the heat, yeah. um, we don't have the facility, the full facility yet um, to be able to handle large groups, whether it's um, raining or 106 degrees. Um, so they're coming out once a month at this point as well now during the summer. Um, but they come out and they work with the horse in a similar way, but it's dialed into more of a self-healing and reflective. We kind of tailor our curriculum and change it a little bit depending on who we're working with and what exercises uh, work best for that group. Um, getting the horse to hook onto them and follow them around with no halter and lead rope where the horse makes that choice that they want to be with that person. And they're looking at that participant as a good leader and someone that they can trust and believe in. And that goes both ways. You have to also trust that horse as much as you want that horse to trust you. So it's a two-way street on a lot of these things. And we work on um, all the different skill sets that are, go along with that. Uh, emotional control, nonverbal communication, uh, situational awareness, body positioning. Uh, there's just so many things that are all tied in to our program. So with the horse working for about six months, six to eight months with the recovery and addiction group before moving on to our youth group. So we have an after school program that we do in Fresno where we bring two of the trained gentled Mustangs down into the inner city. And we work with kids that are, um, inner city kids that are prone to gangs, gun violence, um, you know, they're just kind of having a hard time. And we partner with another nonprofit. They bring the kids, we bring the program, and we work together to create a 
an atmosphere that is good, um, genuine. Uh, the kids come in, they work with horses, they learn how to, you know, do everything that's involved with them, not only on the emotional control stuff, but also part of our horsemanship curriculum where they're learning how to lead the horses, to groom them. They learn to saddle them. They learn to ride them. They go through the whole process of working with horses. And again, we're just working on all these skill sets of leadership, trust, boundaries is a huge one in that group where we learn about our boundaries, the horse's boundaries, how to maintain them without getting uh, too much or too, you know, like hostile, right? We want to do it in a gentle kind of way to where we don't scare the horse, that the horse still wants to be with us, but they respect the boundary that's set. So there's a lot of different things that we work on that really help those kids um, down in the inner city. And that's a weekly uh, program. So we run that every week for the duration of the school year. So we're down there, you know, working with kids and um, just having a good time. We rent an indoor arena at a, at a barn that's really close to these six different apartment complexes. Um, so it's really accessible for them. It's hard to get them out here at the ranch. So yeah. moving that program into town, we've had huge success with it. Um, and so the same horses that the veterans train are now helping kids in the inner city and um, it's just a ripple effect of how everyone can get healing from these horses. I mean, we've got horses here that have helped hundreds, hundreds of people over the last um, seven years that we've been doing this. So our programs aren't all haven't all been running for seven years, but that's where it started and it's grown into this over the you know this amount of time. Wow, how many people show up at the arena every week? So it varies. Um, Usually it's about 12. Our, our limit is 20. So okay. up to sometimes, uh, but we've had as little as five. Um, there was a high speed chase and a shooting. Uh, half, so, uh, the, one of the apartment complexes was shut down and the kids were not able to come. That was one of the weeks we only had, I think, five kids show up. But they're going through a lot. They're getting out of school. They come there. So we have food, cold drinks. We sit down and we talk and we work with the horses. We learn a lot. And then we just kind of sit down at the end and kind of answer questions, go through what we learned and how we can use that in everyday life yeah. instead of being with the horses and leave it at the barn. I want them to take these lessons with them um, because life's hard. And down there in the city, it's really hard for these kids to navigate. So by giving them a few tools that they can use and they can um, take with them out into the world, um, that's really rewarding for us. Oh, how exciting. Now, have you had kids from the youth program? Have some of them been with you the entire time? Yes. So we had um, 10 that actually got a certificate of completion because they were there through the entire process. They have a test at the end that they have to prove what they've learned and show me how they can do it on their own. Um, like I tell them, I'm not going to saddle your horse for you. Like if you can't catch your horse, groom it, saddle it, do all the stuff, um, then you aren't completing the course. So it really gets them coming back. It gives them an accomplishment. Um, they really like that. Some of the kids come as much as they can, but they're just not able to be there every week or they don't make the choice to be there every week. So it's really about their choice to um, not go stand on the street corner and come to this program instead. So we see that. It, the draw is there and some of them are able to make that choice and come. Mm -hmm. uh, others will come about half the time when they're having a really bad day, they'll show up um, because they just want to hug that horse and go off in the corner and pet the horse, which is, you know, that's what it's for. Um, but other times they're feeling the influence of their peers and they don't show up. So it's their choice. Like the horses have free will. So do these kids. Wow. No one's forcing them to be there. Well, so this gets me into some of the other areas. You do some is it like school partnerships. And these are different kids, though, than what you're doing in the inner city, correct? Um, well, we're starting to do that. So we are an approved vendor for the Fresno Unified School District. So we are starting to reach out with this coming school year and to be um, more involved in different things. But this after school program is kind of how it all started. Okay. And do you do things too with people that are um, emotionally or mentally challenged? 
I do. Um, that's not primarily what we do. We mostly right. work with people trauma, but I do have um, autistic kids that I've worked with or continue to work with. Mm -hmm. But that's more on an individual basis Got and it. a private hard to do that in a group um, just because of the time and attention that it takes. We had um, a nonverbal, um, I guess she would be about five years old um, mentally, but she's probably 10 or 12 now. Um, and she was nonverbal when she came to work with us. And she's kind of a special case. She was waiting on a waiting list for another uh, place and her family was having a hard time. And so I agreed to take her on and she's been with us almost a year now. And she talks to everyone about her horse and the ridefoundation.org. She just like goes on about, uh, she loves flower, the horse that she's been working with. And to her, that's her horse that she comes and rides every week. And it's made a, a significant improvement on her speech and um, at her IEP meeting or her, her yeah. meeting that with all the different um, counselors and people that she works with through the school district, um, everyone is talking about what an improvement it has been for her, how much it has helped her. And we love that. I Unfortunately, I can't, at this point of the process, I can't really do a lot of that because it is very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, work with one individual instead of having a program running where I can help you know up to 20 at one time. Right. But it has been really rewarding to help her and to see her growth through this. Um, so that's just one example of, yes, we do work with others uh, that have more of a developmental issue. But typically, I refer them to, there's two other places close by that do that. Mm -hmm. And they know old ranch horses that that is what works for them. Because right. for right. that, um, these exactly. horses are really for emotional control they really are in tune with how you feel and right. they are reflecting exactly how you feel so that's where that healing comes from on you know with the wild horse with the veterans how i mean how long do they stay with you in this program because to me if they all stayed forever it would grow so huge you would need many many horses at a bigger facility well we're getting to that point <laughs> <laughs> that's great um, yes. So we've had people in our veterans, the co-ed group that I'm talking about, we've had um, some of them with us since 2019. So before COVID, this all started. And then obviously we took a break and then we started back up. Um, and they, once we've, once we've been in our program and you're kind of part of our ride family, then you're always welcome to come back. I'll have some of the veterans just contact me and say, I've had a really bad week. I know we're not scheduled to be there, but is there any time that I can come out and just be with the horses or do you need any help around the ranch? And they just find that this ranch is a safe place for them to kind of get their selves back together. So we always have, you know, kind of them coming and going. Uh, they might not be still coming to the program every time, but they are always welcome here. Even if it's just to sit under our shade tree and hang out um, where our door is open. It's an open door policy for anyone who's been part of our programs. Well, once they have been through all the training things, they understand, they understand the relationship with the horses and what their responsibility is with it. What wonderful skills you're so giving people. Oh my gosh. The veterans, uh, one in particular who worked with Kina from the beginning, which is the one of our horses that um, has recently went into the kids program um, last year. And so he just loves the horse so much. And he goes and he volunteers for that youth group because he oh. wants you to be part of Kina's process. And he also grew up in a similar situation. So being a veteran, but also having the experience that he can relate to these kids is huge. So it just, like I said, it has a ripple effect and it kind of just goes across the whole board. Wow. Oh, and I love that. That is what building community is about. That's what healing is truly about. It can't just stay isolated. It needs oh. to not just spread, but interconnect because that's what gives it that strength that weaving gives it the strength. And paid it forward. So he got a lot of help and he's really, um, learned a lot of things about the horses that now he can help teach others about that and 
I've tried to pay him and say, hey, I need an assistant for this program. Would you like to, um, you know, potentially be that person? He says, no, I don't feel right about that. I just want to help. So, I mean, it, it's huge. The healing is continuing. It's still helping him going there and working with the kids. It's helping him just as much, maybe more than coming here at the beginning of what he was learning uh, through the horses. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for that. If people want to help you, and what if they're not, you know, it's not nearby, not convenient, like the, the kids that, you know, can't get to you. How can people help? I, we know they can write a check. Yes. Can they say, I want to sponsor like a scholarship for and direct it towards specific programs? Do they tell me how people can help and what makes the most sense for you? So um, we have people that like to sponsor a horse. So they'll pay for the monthly costs of a horse. We have people that want to sponsor a participant, um, want to help the foster kids that we work with. So there's a group in Oakhurst, uh, which is a neighboring community, um, that we work with kids that have been or are in the foster care system because there's a lot of trauma there as well. Yes. So that program, um, we have people wanting to sponsor children to make sure that they can make it through that program or get to that program. Um, sponsoring horses, sponsoring programs, sponsoring individuals, liking and sharing our content online is huge just for the exposure so that people know who we are and what we're doing. This is a very unique approach um, to this issue where most people think, oh, they're just leading people around on horses or people are coming and grooming the horses. But wh what we're doing is so much more than that. It's not a horse rescue. We don't just take in horses that people don't want. This right. horse we take in have to be able to be used for our programs. Um, there has to be a benefit for the human end of it. Um, so, you know, sharing our story or letting people know, letting your friends and family know who we are and what we're doing and our unique approach, kind of getting the word out there, because most people are like, oh, you're a horse rescue. Like, no, actually, mm -hmm. no, we're close to a horse rescue. Um, but because it is such a unique approach, people aren't really aware that this is even possible, much less happening right here in the community. Great. So if you're listening to this, go to the ridefoundation.org and you can see all their programs. They're generous people, yes, but all the ways you can help get involved. Maybe you know somebody that could benefit that lives in the area that could benefit. Maybe you know a veteran. Maybe you know somebody that's in addiction recovery that's in one of those areas that could benefit from helping these horses by reframing your thinking, healing yourself. They are healing themselves. I just love the connection, the emotional connection and awareness that you are giving people, Sarah. It's just beautiful to hear these stories and the shift that happens through observation, because that is an easier way for mo most people to learn rather than a list of things that they are doing wrong or need to do. And coming from a human, a lot of times in our programs, whether it's addiction, whether it's a veteran, they're kind of closed off to that because people have been telling them what to do or what they should be doing for quite some time and obviously it's not helping. So for them to realize it on their own through the horse's behavior is so powerful. Um, it's just really amazing how it works and it's really emotional, not only for the person working in the corral, but for everyone watching and seeing how their body language is affecting that horse's behavior. I mean, it's night and day. I had one, uh, one woman from our recovery and addiction who came in and the horse just started running and she's like, what do I do? What do I do? She was panicking. I said, just take a deep breath and calm down. Calm yourself down. Drop your shoulders and all your energy. And as soon as she did, the horse just stopped. I mean, it's like a sliding stop like you see in the arena. The horse just stopped and dropped its head and walked right. And everyone on the deck was just like, oh, my gosh. Like they couldn't believe that all she had to do was control herself. And that was influencing the horse's behavior. That is great. That's a wonderful bit of awareness for all of us to have what we bring into a room, as you said at the beginning of this, what we bring into the grocery store, how our posture, my kids can read me like a wild Mustang. I mean, they, they can read me and they'll just say, what's the matter? I said, what? I said, your face, you're standing erect, you're standing this way. You know, 
why why are you clenching and it's like how do you why are they noticing all that <laughs> and i i can't bluff them because they know yeah. <laughs> they read <Hi>. me <laughs> This has been a wonderful episode. Again, I'm Susan Finch. I've been your host today. And this is part of our Mr. Ballin Foundation series on all volunteer, all heart from Binky Patrol. You can find us at binkypatrol.show, binkypatrol.org to learn about our organization or in all your favorite podcast apps. Thank you so much for joining us. Please consider sharing this episode, subscribing to our podcast and learning more about the ridefoundation.org. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you. Oh, it was fun. I really loved hearing your stories. That's the best part of this. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>